And we are live on Facebook on Augusta Free Press. Uh, the show is Street Knowledge. I'm Chris Graham, joined by Scott German. We're going to talk some mainly UVA sports news, some ACC as well, uh, both football and basketball. We've got a lot to get into. And Scott, I guess we'll start. We, you know, we talked on Monday. We were going to start and do most of today's show uh, on UVA basketball because um, what else are you going to talk about with Abilene Christian coming up this weekend? But then... Yesterday, the news dropped, surprise news, shocking news uh, out of Charlottesville. Uh, Jawan Briggs, the, the top recruit from a couple of years ago, uh, sophomore, uh, announces not only is he not going to return for his junior season, but he's leaving now, going to the transfer portal. Caught everybody by surprise, apparently, including his coaches. Uh, Nick Howell today talking with reporters, uh, saying he had no advance warning. Bronco Mendenhall last night on his radio show saying the same thing. Wow, Scott, I, I just I don't know what to say. Juwan Briggs uh, is is uh, kind of got us all uh, thrown for a loop here. Well, and from from what the coaches are saying, no one saw it coming. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't as though he you know had been expressing disappointment. He was certainly it can't be over playing time. Um, and 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 you know, I, I, certainly they, these kids have a right to 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 change you know to go in different directions or change your mind. But, you know, it's kind of disappointing to think he would wait until the this time in the season to quit, which kind of makes me feel like maybe there's a little more, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. Um, when all the dust settles, that he might end up having gone maybe back to, I think he's from Ohio. Is that right. correct? He's um, in that area, yeah. Maybe Ohio State. And then if that's the case, if it's a, you know, one of these prearranged things, maybe Ohio State said it might be in your best interest to just uh, not play anymore this season. I hope that's not the case, but if it turns out to be the case, then it's kind of disappointing to think that a player would quit on his team like that. And I don't know any other word to use, but he, he quit on his team. Yeah, you know, because it, it, there's only four weeks left in the season. I mean, if you play the season out and you leave at the end of the season, it would still shock us. I mean, he was the top recruit from Broncos class a couple of years ago, the top recruit of the Bronco era to this date through five recruiting classes for, for Bronco men and all. Um, you know, so if you play to the end of the season and, and then leave, it would still be, you know, surprising news to say, well, you know, this kid who looks like, you know, the, the surprising part of this, Scott, uh, among other things, well, yeah, it's not about playing time. He's, he's getting plenty, he's starting, he's, he's, he's playing well. He was playing well. Um, it's that he seemed like such a perfect fit for UVA. Uh, you know, not only a four-star recruit, uh, I think he was a number three defensive lineman in his class, in the, the 2018 uh, recruiting class. Um, but also, boy, he's a smart kid, uh, a talented kid, a talented singer, a vocalist, uh, involved in two university uh, choir groups. He sang, at the, he sang the national anthem a couple times before UVA basketball games. You know, just a wide-ranging, wide talented uh, kid who happens to be really, really good at football. And so, uh, you know, he's the kind of guy that you, if you're Bronco Mendenhall, you hold up and say, that's the kind of kid that we can win football games with. Uh, you know, smart kid who happens to be really good at football. Thus, he's a good student at UVA and a good football player for the UVA program. Uh, and so it's that. It's not, you know, it's, it's that. I mean, that's, that, that gets me more than anything. Uh, and it apparently got Bronco Mendenhall too. You know, uh, the, the depth chart came out on Monday. Uh, Juwan Briggs was listed at number one on the depth chart on Monday. Uh, you know, the way they do things over there, Monday is a day where they pretty much watch film, um, have position group meetings. Tuesday, they start doing some, some physical stuff again. Uh, he, you know, he made this news announcement to, I guess, obviously to his, to the staff on Tuesday. So, um, you know, as of Monday, when they're putting the depth chart out, no news. And then all of a sudden he's leaving the program. Yeah, that's what gets I, – I, I agree with you, Scott. It's, it's that he's quitting on his team. And you hate to say that about a young guy. The kid's 19 years old. And we hate to, you know, throw these terms out. But it does, it does feel like – it does feel like he's quitting on his teammates. And, you know, I would be a little leery. And, and, and of course, he's a talented player and, and you know, projected NFL player potentially down the road too. But, man, I'd be leery if I was the next school to pick up a kid who, who, who not – again, not leaving at the end of the season – leaving in the middle of the season and leaving his team in alerts. We'll talk about that in a second, but leaving his team in alerts, man, that's, that just, that, that just seems really, really odd. Yeah. It, it's, I mean, no way, any way you slice it, it's not a, it's not a good look on his behalf. Um, and of course, Bronco being the class act is 
that we know he is, the only thing that he really said was it was an honor to coach him. Um, and you know there's a lot more going on in Bronco's mind than that. It would be if he did that to me. But, you know, I'm just wondering um, with – with the new, with the new regu- um, the new re- the, um, mandate from the governor, I think now there's only 250 people, uh, fans allowed in attendance. And I'm, I'm not, I don't know this, but his parents probably were coming up to the games. Now they probably won't, can't, if it's just 250 people. Um, I wonder how much of it had to do with this pandemic, COVID-19, quarantining, and, and he's looking down the road and there's no certain no certainty about what's going to happen, although there's encouraging news, right? Even in, from Charlottesville, there's encouraging news on the pandemic, but looking down the road thinking, maybe it's better if, if I do transfer and maybe transfer back closer to, to his home in the, in, in the Cincinnati area. I don't think any of that has to have anything to do with this for, for lots of reasons. And I'll go, I'll go, cause I actually, my wife and I discussed this last night. So I'm kind of prepared to talk about that one. I mean, this is a, you know, you normally when a, when a, any player decides to transfer, especially a high profile player, like a Jawan Briggs decides to transfer. The first thing you do is look around and say, all right, what's going on. Is it maybe something on campus, you know, a grounds thing? Is it, is it something within the program? Um, it's hard to say that this year because everybody's having everybody's having a weird year. Every every one of the 127 Division One A programs, FBS programs, having a weird season. Kids are are taking their classes online. Uh, that's that's not unique to UVA. Uh, it's not unique to UVA that your parents have to come to the games and it's you know there's not a lot of fans at games. I mean it's, that's not unique to UVA or anybody. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, it's been tough. It's, it's tough for everybody. I wonder just maybe in general, if the, if the toughness of this season has maybe made him rethink some things uh, that have, because next year, honestly, if, if we're still doing exactly what we're doing now, a year from now, there's a lot bigger things to worry about than whether or not your parents get to come to the games. I mean, it, the world might be a different place and I'm not saying it's going to be the vaccine news is, uh, is what it is. It's, it's great news. I mean, we had another news today from Pfizer there. They've upgraded their efficacy of their vaccine to 95%. We, we understand that vaccines are going to be going out in the next couple of weeks uh, to that first level of people, the healthcare workers, uh, including, uh, you know, we'll break the news here, I guess, at UVA. Uh, so, um, so this is great news. I don't know that that has anything to do with it. it you know, if we're going to parse what could lead to these decisions by him, I mean, you know, is it is it, it, you almost have to think is it more football related? Um, you know, he to me, he's a classic three, four nose guard, a uh, nose tackle. Um, uh, you, you know, it, it, and, and, and he's a he's six one, 310 pounds, big, strong kid. Uh, and, uh, you know, the job of a nose tackle uh, uh, in a three, four, because, you know, nose tackles in a three, four, it's, it's a different skill set than being a defensive tackle. Uh, in the in the four three, you know, you're at three four. You don't get a lot of tackles. You don't get a lot of stats. Um, so it's not like, oh wow, I'm not getting a lot of opportunity here. You're you're supposed to take up two blockers to let your defensive ends and linebackers get more one on one opportunities. They make the tackles, but you do your job by making them block the hell out of you. He had two sacks in the Wake Forest game. He had three sacks overall this season. Um, his Pro Football Focus grade had him ranked in the top twenty five percent. Of, um, of college interior linemen this year. He's only a sophomore. He's only going to get better. So, you know, you, you mentioned Scott, you know, he's from Cincinnati. Um, you know, maybe Ohio State, maybe Ohio State, either somebody whispered to him, whispered to a family member, whatever the case may be. Hey, you come here and you can do all those things. We'll coach you up. You get to be uh, Ohio State pedigree. And when you leave school after your junior or senior year uh, and look for the NFL, you can do it with an Ohio State degree instead of a UVA degree, and that's going to help you out. I have to think it's got to be a football factor. I can't imagine it's anything else because, again, the kid fits so perfectly at UVA in every other respect. Yeah, and I, I agree with you, but to counter that, if he's a pro football prospect nowadays, I don't think it matters whether he's playing at UVA or Ohio State. Um, he's going to get seen. Every game's on TV. Um and, you know, Ohio State, sure, sure. I mean, it's one of the um, premier programs in the country, one of the probably top five, arguably. 
maybe maybe top three. But you know, I, I can't. If that's the case, then at least he should have played out this season. Yeah, that I can see that. The other part of that is if your heart's not in it, um, you know, and you go out there and get hurt. I mean, that can change your aspects, your your, your prospects too. Um, so the opposite know, end of that spectrum, if that, you know, we're talking about, okay, well, you don't want to play anymore because you could get injured. Think about the opposite end of that spectrum and Trevor Lawrence. Right. I mean, what, what reason does Trevor Lawrence have to play the rest of, to play this season for that matter, but he's been out there. He was, in fact, he was one of the advocates about even having a college football season back in July. He was I at think the, that says a lot about Trevor Lawrence and what a great young guy tremendous. he must be. You know, and if you look at the season, I was watching um, sports news last night and he's, he's actually, Vegas has actually got him down to tied for second for a favorite to win the Heisman. So he's, because he's missed a couple of games, he slid a little bit, but I mean, who cares about that? He's still going to be the first pick in the draft. We know that. It will be the first pick in the he's, draft. He's, he's the hardware he can put on his shelf. There um, are going to, there are teams lining up to lose games right now in the NFL to have a chance to draft him number one. Yeah. Uh, and, oh, and the Jets fans were irate the other week because they actually were leading the Patriots late in the game and miraculously found a way to win or to, to win. According to Jets fans, they found a way to win, even though they lost to the Patriots, the Jet fans view that as a win. No, and, and so the fact that he's playing tells you what, what a great young guy he is. And I'm not trying to say Jawan Briggs is not a great young guy. Uh, we all make decisions for what's best for us. And if, if he does, it's, it, the odd thing is if he's deciding it's, it's time to move on from a football perspective, yeah, he's, he's you know, I, I looked at his Twitter page yesterday when the news came out, and I was trying to get a sense like his – Sometimes you can read in a social media and glean that a person is going through some issues. There were there's not there was nothing looking at his social media that would make because he was retweeting you know, up till this past weekend, you know, and he did, he did, he's not someone who's there all the time, but he was retweeting teammates and he was you know uh, re, uh, retweeting highlights of himself and and, and UVA and he, he was very he seemed like a very happy guy. I mean from the outward appearance from social media it didn't seem like a guy who's like you know uh, thinking about other things so um anyway he's he, now the impact on uva from a football standpoint let's talk about that for just a second i, I kind of broke this down yesterday so many people wrote about this i figured i'd do something a little different and uh, i wanted to look at uh what this leaves virginia now of course this weekend i believe christian you're you know virginia's favored by uh, between 35 and a half and 40 points uh, so it's not going to impact this week, but it should impact. It will impact later this season, Boston College, Florida State, um, and the Virginia Tech games that we have to finish up the season with. Uh, it leaves Virginia right now with just four guys who've played more than three snaps on defensive line. Um, and you, you have a backup at nose tackle. Jameer Carter is, is a freshman, and he played some limited action. Um, you could see – uh, either Adi Batariwa, the JMU grad transfer, or Mandy Alonzo, the senior. Um, those guys, um, from a size standpoint, actually, they could probably, they'd be a little, you know, they'd be stretching a little bit maybe, but they're both 6'1", 6'2", 280-ish guys. Uh, I can see them playing nose tackle and doing it well, and they've got a lot of snaps this year uh, at defensive end, so it's not hard to imagine them sliding over to the, to the nose tackle. Um, the emergence of Nusi Milani, the freshman 6'6", 260, uh, who got 25 snaps last week against Louisville uh, at defensive end. He gives you some flexibility to maybe move either Atari Watt or, or Alonso over. Um, and uh, I'm trying to think, who else am I missing here? Uh, uh, Carter, Atari Watt, Alonso, Milani, I guess that's your four guys. Uh, ben Smiley, registered freshman, he's played three snaps this year. Uh, and so, uh, he's, he's a guy, I mean, gosh, I'm going to try to pronounce his name. This is, this is, this is not good live. Ola Sakonomni Agungwai. That's probably not very good pronunciation. He's a true freshman, uh, no snaps this year, but, uh, and they may have been trying to redshirt him, but he may have to give them some depth because you only have three positions on the defensive line on a three, four. Uh, but right now you've got four guys, maybe a fifth and Ben Smiley. You might need some more numbers there. Uh, well, the good so, thing is if this year is indeed a mulligan, then you may not need to redshirt him. 
Well, that's that's part of that, yeah. Uh, and it's, it's so maybe it's, the issue isn't as much the redshirting issue as it is the um, <laughs> the the kid hasn't played issue, uh, and and there's probably a reason he hasn't played, kind of thing. So, uh, but yeah, you're you're definitely thin on the line, and you've got four games to play, and you know Abilene Christian won't be a tough game, but I mean, you know now you gotta you gotta watch, you know you gotta be careful, and, and it's not like you can put your there's no. There's no third team defensive line to put in, Scott. You, you, at this stage, when you're up, if you're up like you should be on Saturday and you're up 51-7 in the fourth quarter, you're going to still see those names out there because there's no, literally nobody else to put out there uh, to, to take those snaps. And that's going to be something that's going to affect this team down the stretch. And we remember what lack of depth can do to you. We don't have to think far back from the, the Tundra Bowl in, in, in uh, Annapolis. Oh, dear Lord, yes. Uh, yeah. When we basically had no reserves, That's yeah, that, that, the offensive line was the issue that day. Yeah, you didn't have anybody on the offensive line, and yeah, that game didn't obviously didn't go well. Yeah. Um, so to change course a little bit, we wish him well. Um, I wish it would have turned out a little different for him, but um, get your thoughts on something I was reading yesterday. So the NCAA is this year has has sit has has. Um, the mandate that a team has to have at least six wins to go to a bowl game is not going to be applicable this year. Okay. So what, what do you do if you're Virginia tech and you've got the nation's longest bowl streak, I think at what, 27 in a row or something like that, maybe something like that. Yeah. And tech, maybe only wins five, five and six, or, I mean, it, it could be very possible that Tech is looking at four and seven. If you're Tech, do you take a bowl bid to keep that streak alive? And if you do take it, is, should there just be a giant asterisk behind that? What, what, that's an interesting dilemma that uh, Tech might be facing. They could face it and they won't, they might not be alone. You know, uh, and, and sort of related, I didn't write about this this week, but Bronco Mendenhall was asked a couple of questions at the presser this week. Uh, about uh, this year and playing a bowl just in general. I mean, you know, if, if you're not Clemson and Alabama and Ohio State and, you know, teams competing for the playoff and p- competing for a possible national championship, uh, one reporter phrased that, hey, look, you know, this year's been so tough in terms of COVID compliance and all the protocols and all that. You know, most years, obviously, you want a bowl, even if it's the military bowl or whatever it was a couple years ago, that, that, that moment we froze our arches off. Um, you want that just because it gives you a couple extra weeks of practice. And that's a couple extra weeks for your freshmen to get experience and your sophomores who maybe didn't get as much time um, to get more practice time, that kind of thing. And you want that. But this year with the COVID protocols in place, do you even want that was sort of the question posed to Bronco. And, and Bronco said, yeah, you know, yeah. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, it's, it's tough, but, you know, the team wants to play football. And I remember Bronco talking, you know, I, I jumped on those Zooms back, gosh, dating back into the spring, but, especially in summer training camp, you know, he, he, back when we didn't know if we were even going to have a season, I mean, they were practicing with the faith that there would be a season. And he said, you know, um, I, I keep asking my guys and they keep saying they want to play football. And he kind of reiterated that general point this week. You know, like my guys want to play football, you know, it's not easy, but they want to play football. Uh, and so, so, yeah, I mean, so in that context, yeah, I mean, I, you know, and whether there's an asterisk or not, in 10 years, you wouldn't pay it. If, if Tech were to continue that streak and it gets to 37 or 47, they're not, you know, you're not going to remember that 2020 they were four and seven. You might look on Wikipedia or whatever that is in 20 years and say, yeah, they're kind of vaguely remember they were terrible that year, but they're still going to have a streak. So, um, but yeah, I think the, I think that bigger issue too is just if you can play more, if you can play one more game, these guys generally want to play one more game. So, um, and, and Hey, well, you know, I, I usually just, Scott, usually when we discuss and, and when I discuss with others, uh, the bowl season, I'm like, ah, the bowl season sucks. I wish we'd get rid of bowls. I don't like bowls, bowls stink. You know, if you're not playing the playoff, then you're just playing the NIT and I don't watch the NIT this year. I'm watching the bowls because they're sports and, um, I want to support as much as I can. So I'll be watching all the, the Yankee, the pinstripe bowls and the military bowls and the, uh, poinsettias and all those crazy balls because, um, you know, one, I'm a sports fan, and and two, the kids, gosh, we talked about this Monday, Scott, but the kids are putting out so much to be able to play that I want to reward them as much as I can just by 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 tuning in. 
Yeah, I agree. They get, you know, it's it, get to travel, get some nice gifts. Um, you know, the one, the one thing that might offset that thought process of, well, you go to a bowl because you get a couple extra weeks for practicing. Well, some of these teams are going to be, Virginia included, they're going to be playing up till December 12th. And the military bowl, I think, was on the 28th. So that's about all you would get is two weeks. Um, they're not, it's not like the season ends the Saturday after Thanksgiving for most of the schools, unless you're Army, Navy, or playing in a conference championship game. So these schools that are playing up till December 12th, uh, and these bowls, some of these low, lower level bowl games are beginning in late December. Uh, there's not that much extra practice time being, uh, you know, available to them. But oh, well, I think, they're you know, all mid to late December. Those those bowls that are not the top tier bowls, yeah, that's a great point. And and Mendenhall did say that jump, jumping on your point there, jumping off your point there, um, he did say that economics would factor into that too. You know, the athletics department's going to have to look. And and it's it, it, we're at a stage in the season where they're still thinking football. I mean, I'm sure there are probably people in the front office there, Brian Hall, who are thinking about if there's a bowl opportunity, then what will we do? Um, because economics have to work out too. I mean, obviously, you know, there's a, there's a tremendous expense with, well, the testing that would be involved. You have two more weeks of testing. Those tests I mean, aren't free. Um, you know, three times a week times a hundred people plus support staff. I mean, that's, that's some money, um, your travel, your lodging, uh, et cetera. And then how much is the check? I mean, are we, are we doing all this to break even? That's one consideration. Then you say two weeks of practice, but we're going to break even financially. Maybe there's a value to that. Are we going to, are we going to get a check? Are we going to get a, Are we going to break us, us make a small profit? That's a consideration. Are we going to do all this and lose money and then put players at risk from a, just a football injury standpoint? Um, so there's a lot there. That, that factor may be a bigger factor than all the other factors, whether or not, uh, and right now we know, I mean, there's not going to be people at these games. There's not going to be many more than what we have now. I mean, you know, 500, 1,000, whatever it may be at these games. So the money is going to be all ESPN money because essentially ESPN runs almost all the bowls at this stage. So if ESPN is willing to write your check and you get something out of that and you, you, you can make money and get more two more weeks of practice, you'll do it. Otherwise, I don't know if you do it. I saw in that same story, they were doing some bowl predictions and one of the bowls and it made me cr uh, cringe a little bit. One of the predictions has us in the military bowl against Tulsa. And, and I thought, you know, on the surface, Oh no, not the military bowl. Cause we remember the last time we went there, we were eight floors above the playing field. Uh, and it was, 30 degrees in the press box, uh, having to defog the windows every other play. So the, the military bowl doesn't have, doesn't bring fond memories to us. But if you look at it from a standpoint, the military bowl could be very attractive to a school like UVA. First of all, travel, they're going to probably not make the mandate to get there like a week early. They may, they may only have to go a couple of days early. Um, so the travel expenses will be greatly reduced and um, it's not a situation where the school's going to have to be faced with committing to buy a bunch of tickets. That's true. Yeah. That is so, a big factor. Yeah. You're a, a bowl like the military bowl or the, the previously the belt bowl, which I have learned is now the Duke's mayonnaise bowl. Oh dear. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Can you imagine some of the headlines that'll be, the, the title, the, the storyline has headlines of after a team, you know, lays an egg or something like that, you know. Lays an egg. They didn't cover the spread. Yeah. <laughs> cover the spread. Uh, uh, oh, so, dear. Yeah. Some of these bowls, like that bowl, the military bowl, they could be very attractive for schools like UVA and in and, and, and that it's not as cost prohibitive to go to a bowl like that than it would be to say send the team out. The ACC has a tie in with the Sun Bowl. Yeah. I'm going to go on a limb here and think that this year you're going to see maybe just a one year departure from things. Cause yeah, it doesn't, it makes no sense. Let's say Boston college gets into the sun bowl. I mean, so we're going to fly from Boston to freaking El Paso 
for no. If you can play close to home, so Boston College should be in the. Let's just go ahead and put them in a pinstripe bowl, right? You know, next year, like you even play in the. Uh, this year, the Fenway Park was supposed to host host a game. True, true. Yeah, yeah let them play, play that game. Next year. Syracuse is in the is in the uh, the pinstripe bowl. Virginia and Virginia Tech, you know, are belt the, bowl. Belt uh, bowl. The previously, the belt bowl, the military bowl. bowl you yeah. know, uh, that, that do it. Do things that way this year. Um, just to get basically because bowl games are just extra games anyway. So let's just let's just put people geographically and play games um, and, and call them bowl games. Yeah, and um, I mean, you could even be creative and, and look at it like if something were to happen and, and, and the pandemic gets worse and some of these games gets canceled, uh, yet they still have a bowl season. Let's say hypothetically the UVA Tech game cannot be played. Well, the UVA Tech game could make a very interesting military bowl. Oh, or a Duke's, a Duke's mayonnaise bowl. Or a Duke's mayonnaise bowl. Yeah. 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 We could, we could spread a lot of cheer that way. Um, yeah. No, there's, there's a way to, I mean, so th that, th this is going to be interesting to see. I mean, we're, you know, we're at that stage where we're four weeks from the end of the season, you know, and we've got to, and, and that's got to happen quickly, as you point out, Scott, because the season normally ends the, the, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday after Thanksgiving. Um, and, uh, and we normally start seeing those bowl games starting to shape up pretty quickly thereafter. Um, it's going to happen have, have that really quick now with the season ending December 12th. And then actually the ACC championship game the 19th. Uh, some of those games would normally start like one of the, the following, you know, they would sometimes start. The, the, the early games will start that weekend that we are playing the, the conference championship game. So I don't know what they're going to do, but it has to happen quickly. And it's got to make sense from the bottom line standpoint, both now, obviously, from the school standpoint, the individual school standpoint, but from the ESPN standpoint, the ACC, all the other conferences standpoints, um, there's a lot of incentive on the part of ESPN and the conferences to play these games. That means there's going to be incentive given to the schools to play these games. It's just a matter now of how we make it all happen. It's going to be a fun last three or four weeks. It is. Inter it is. Yeah. Seeing where it all goes. Yeah, indeed. So buckle up, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, hey, tonight's the NBA draft, and I was, uh, you know, one of our one of our readers uh, who, who communicates with me regularly said, "Hey, Chris, haven't seen you do anything about Mami Diakite and his draft prospects." And, you know, and I hate to say, I hadn't even thought about it. It's weird to say the draft is not normally in November, so I'm not thinking like when I'm writing my story list up each week and kind of adapting them every day. Oh yeah, it's November. I should be writing about the NBA draft. But so this the the the, the reader got me thinking. I better do a story. Um, the draft is tonight, uh, and I, I kind of looked at uh, as many draft mock drafts as I could to get a feel for, you know, because Mamadi had declared last year uh, for the draft at, when everybody else did. He came back for the senior season, his redshirt senior season, um, and uh, you know, so he he's he's been on the NBA executives' radar for a couple of years now. I'm getting the feel, Scott, this is probably not going to surprise you when I say this. I'm getting the feel from the mock drafts. He's probably not going to hear his name called tonight. But um, I would not be surprised if before we go to bed tonight, we don't hear uh, that he's probably signed with someone as an undrafted free agent will be in somebody's camp in a couple of weeks. Um, I, I get a feel for the, the fact that there seems to be a, a sense that he can be a, a guy in camp, maybe a guy who can make a roster, uh, at least playing the G League, assuming assuming that you know the G League gets up and running uh, here in a few weeks. But he's probably not he's probably not worth a draft pick um, because there's only two rounds. So um, there could be some news involving Mamadi, but probably not draft news regarding Mamadi. I agree with you 100. percent I don't think Mamadi will be drafted, uh, which I don't I also don't think that's a bad thing because um, if you look at it, if if he is drafted, it's going to be somewhere low in the second round and um, to a team that probably is just taking a real long shot uh, at, at drafting him. So an undrafted free agent, if he's hired, which we, I'm assuming he's already ha hired an agent, uh, an agent's going to be able to kind of, you know, hand pick where he may go. So I think that's going to be a more advantageous for Mamadi. And I wouldn't be surprised if, he does get put on a, you know, does sign with somebody as a free agent and, and then go to some developmentally, the G League, because remember, there's no summer season. Right, right. There hasn't no been summer, summer season. And I think that would, that has probably hurt him 
because he didn't have a chance to work out to show what he can do, show where he's improved his game. So I think that's probably the big one of the bigger reasons that he's um, won't be drafted. And but it's not a bad thing to be to to go as a free agent to a team that that his agent feels like he has a better fit with and then maybe go to their G league and just continue to improve his game. And there are guys who go from it because they're only two rounds of the draft. Now we think back Del Curry, uh, father of, of Steph Curry. Uh, Del was, a, I think a fourth round draft pick. I mean, we don't have four rounds of a draft now and Dell played 15 years in the NBA. So, you know, not being drafted is not a sin. And we, Fred Van Vliet is an example of a guy. He's a, he's a, a franchise player for the Toronto Raptors, the, the champs of two years ago. And uh, he was an undrafted free agent. So there are guys who, who, who certainly come up from that rank and, and, and can do well. You know, when I started looking over Mamadi and, and kind of going, doing this story yesterday, you know, if I were to give my, my draft take, we've watched him for four years. Uh, I would say he's a guy that um, he's he's six nine defensively. He's an NBA player already. He's 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 a guy that uh, he's an elite shot blocker. He averaged two two blocks per game uh, at UVA this year, uh, or, or in his, in a, in, oh yeah, the last two years, and when he got all the playing time he got um, in, in the NCAA tournament 2019, averaged two point seven blocks per game. He was really you know ten point five points. Uh, uh, I think it was eight point two rebounds, two point seven blocks per game, sixty percent shooting in the NCAA tournament 2019 really stepped up his play there, but, uh, and then he stepped up, uh, this past season, he averaged 13.7 a game. He showed uh, three point shooting range, 36% from three. Um, his limitation is he's not a post player. He's, he's not going to score in a post. I got uh, looked at numbers. One of the sites I use uh, for, for analytics, uh, he's, he's uh, among the, the, the lowest ranked players, uh, draft eligible players, uh, in terms of uh, his his ability to score in the post on post ups, he averaged 0.84 points per possession, and, and that was lower than a lot of guards, so, which is just not a good good sign. But um, so offensively, he can shoot the three, he can space the floor a little bit, uh, but but defensively, he's an NBA player. So I look at a guy like that and say, all right, we we get him in here on our roster. You know, we got 15 guys, 12 of whom are eligible. You know, 12 of whom are are, are active at any point. At the very worst, he's a guy that works his tail off in practice, makes our starting four or five, you know, our starting power forward center work, work their butts off uh, in practice. Um, and he gives you a few minutes a night when you need him. Uh, and he's a, he's a character guy. We know personally, I mean, we've, 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 we've dealt with him for four years that he is a high caliber character guy. He's a smart guy. He speaks five languages. I think it is. Uh, comes from a background where, you know, it's almost like being a pro basketball player would be a step down from his family standpoint. Uh, and so um, considering their their pedigree and, and what they've done in life. So, um, boy, I mean, an NBA team would would not do themselves wrong at all to have a guy like that in their in, in their clubhouse, in their locker room, so to speak. Uh, and he can give you some stuff. He's not going to be a starting player. I doubt he's a Draymond Green type or a Serge Ibaka type. I'm seeing comparisons from some who are trying to say, "Hey, think of think of him in those terms." Um, but he, he, you know, he he remind he can remind you of those guys. But to to project that he'll play at that level is kind of hard. But uh, at the least, he'll 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 make you better in practice, and he'll give you a few minutes a night on the floor. Yeah, I mean, from a character standpoint, he's he would be at the top of any team. You know, what he brings to that team but uh um you know i think i think he's got a chance to play i just don't think it's going to be initially i think it might be a couple years down the road at least two and it just makes it important that he gets the good fit to start with what's interesting about him is he's 23 years old going he'll, he'll be 24 in a couple of months and um so in one sense he's he's already an older guy but in another sense he's still sort of raw. I mean, you know, he didn't start playing basketball until late in his high school years. And um, he was a soccer player. Uh, and imagining him at 6'9 playing soccer. Um, and you can see the lateral mobility. And that's why I say defensively. I mean, not only in the post and at the rim, he's a shot blocker, but defending the pick and roll, which is the bread and butter play of any NBA offense, not just the high pick and roll, but also that side pick and roll action that a lot of teams like to use. Uh, he's a guy that because he can he can defend guards to, as 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 adeptly as he can defend centers. He can defend your point guard as as well as he can your big guy. Um, that's that's where I mean you know I, I he can be a value. I mean if if you if and if you 
you know, if you don't need a – and he, not all five guys on the floor need to score, can score. There's only one ball. Um, you know, and, and I think his experience, Scott, as a guy who was a role player on that championship team can be valuable here. He's not going to go to the NBA and score 20 points a game. We know that. No. Um, he, can, he can space the floor. He can hit the three. He can hit the, he can hit the pick and pop jump shot. But he was a valuable member of that 2019 title team that had three NBA guys on it ahead of him. Uh, and he didn't need to score the ball to be effective and, and a, a guy who can win a game for you. Uh, and so I think if I'm an NBA scout, I, you know, I know, yeah, last year he scored 13-7 a game. He shot 36% from three, all this stuff. I'm almost looking back a couple of years and saying, that's the mommy DKT I want. I don't need a scorer. I don't need everybody on the floor to score, but I need a guy who can do stuff without scoring. I need a guy who can set screens. I need a guy who can block shots. I need a guy who can defend the pick and roll. He can hit the shot when he's open. He's not a liability when he's open, but he can do all those other things too because you need you, you need glue guys in addition to stars. Yeah, there are plenty of players in the NBA. What's the NBA roster now? 15? 15 with 12 active on any one day. Yeah, so 15 guys you can have, have on your bench there, yeah. Well, let's just say the 12 active. The NBA season, typical NBA season, is 82 games. I think they're playing 72 this year, but still – more than double the college season. More than double. And there are a lot, not as many, but there are plenty back to back nights. There's plenty two games in three nights. There's Probably not more this year. They're starting so late. So, yeah, great point. Yeah. So, those, those are those 10, 11, 12 players on the roster, you need those guys for num- multiple amount of reasons. One, they need to give you, they need to push your starters in practice. Um, and two, they need to be able to go out and give you two or three minutes four minutes, five minutes, every game possibly. But there's many – we watch. We have the NBA ticket. Many, many, many nights these games are blowouts. <laughs> and you pull your LeBron James out with ten minutes to go in the fourth quarter. So you're, you're, you need those guys to come in and be able to – I don't want to say garbage time because they're very, if they are, they're very expensive garbage collectors. But, uh, um, but they have to be – they're counted on a lot more than your walk-ons in college. You know, they're not walk-ons. They are guys that, uh, and all, and all, you know, we all love Grant Kersey and and, and uh, um, uh, Castro, uh, but Austin Castro, yeah, yeah. Austin Castro, but but in reality, those guys aren't seeing a lot of playing time. The NBA guys, those 10, 11, 12th man on the roster that are on that bench. They are. If you look at the end of the season, they most of those guys, and I've looked once, most of those guys are appearing in 45, 50, 55 games. And playing five minutes a night, whatever it might be, average. Uh, and so that means some nights they're just getting in for a minute and some nights they're getting 10 or 12. I mean, yeah. So they're not putting them on the team because they're nice guys. Exactly. They're there for, yeah, they're paying them for a reason. Yeah, they're not there to fill out a roster spot like, our walk-ons are who have to all there's not a feel-good story by letting uh um um, grant kersey play a few minutes these guys in the nba that are at the end of the bench the 10 11 12 man on the men on the roster um they're not on the roster just because they're super good guys off the floor they're bringing something to the team or they wouldn't be on the roster because if that was the case you and i might have been able to play because we were good guys we were, good, we're good guys, yeah. You're 10 through 15 guys. We even put those other guys in there, too. The 10 through 15 guys aren't loading the bus after the game's over, like we saw Grant Kersey at the NCAA tournament. We saw tournament. him loading the, the – The kid the, who had a, the three-pointer to give us 100 points in a Marshall game, and he's loading the, he's loading the uh, equipment on the bus after an NCAA tournament game after wearing a uniform uh, <laughs> earlier in the day. So. Yeah, that was, a, that was a memory that I don't think we'll ever uh, uh, not have in our, in our minds. That's one of the things you see when you get to go to the games like we've done, done all these years. No, so, no, I, I, I won't be surprised to hear his name called tonight. Uh, not, not called, but uh, hear some news about him. I'm going to be actually watching uh, the, 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 the Twitter, especially Adrian Wojnarski, who seems to have all the news about everything, because uh, it won't surprise me to see that he signed with somebody. And actually, yeah, sometimes those situations work out. For example, last year, Kyle Guy got drafted – by the Sacramento Kings, and I think it was uh, Justin Robinson, um, the kid from Tech, the point guard from Tech, didn't get drafted, and he got to choose where he went. He went to Washington. He actually got into the he, – he was on the roster for Washington more than Kyle was for Sacramento, 
uh, in part because he could pick his spot a little better. So, um, so yeah, we'll be rooting for, for Miami. And actually, hey, we'll root for his name to be called. I love for his name to be called. I'll be watching all the way to the end. But um, if he's not, I'm try- I guess we'll be our, we're telling our EVA faithful out there, don't be offended if he's not. He, he's going to he's going to have an opportunity uh, to play in the NBA. Well, it'll, it, it will surprise me if he's not uh, part of some NBA team, either through a two way contract with a G League team or something of that nature. Well, and we also for, we haven't even mentioned the time and he would be an ideal player if he had if he had to play. I don't want to use it as derogatory using the word had, but if he ends up playing uh, overseas somewhere, uh, you know, Mamadi is a great, you know, he's he's a very, very high intelligence level person. So he would fit in well with him. And there's a lot of money to be made playing, uh, you know, in France or, or wherever you're, you know, some of these international teams well and with all those languages he speaks he he's he will speak fluently wherever he goes pretty much right so right, right. Uh, and there's guys i mean think of uh anthony gill still uh do, doing very well in europe in fact he, he remade himself into a three-point shooter and uh, if if he only had been that before he left uva he'd probably be in the nba right now but he's making a great living over there uh sean singletary made a nice living in in uh europe for a few years before he came back to the states and, and, and got into youth coaching um, and so we've had guys do that and do well. Um, but I think Mamadi has indicated that he wants to, you know, he wants to kind of strike out if he has to in the NBA, uh, at least give it a, a year or two to, to do that. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, there's it, it, with him, especially with his, the fact that he's, uh, you know, a native of Africa, he can speak all the language he speaks. Um, he's not limited to just, you know, making a few bucks in the G League and, and thinking that's it. He can do anything he wants to do as far as that goes. I think it's a great point. So before we finish uh let me let me tell you a little bit about my um the uva basketball team starts tips off the season hopefully wednesday before thanksgiving right in uh, the mohegan sun which i've actually been to the mohegan sun would have been a great event for us to go to uh-huh. um um against saint mary against um who uh marist who, who are they playing saint I thought we were playing Maine in the first game. Maine, Maine. I knew it was something with an M. Maine, and then um, and then Florida on Friday. So I think once we get that game started against Maine on Wednesday, my world will will start revolving on its axis again. Because for me, I'm in a time lock here. I'm still waiting for the evening session of the Atlantic Coast Conference basketball tournament that we had pulled out from our underneath of us in Greensboro. I'm still waiting for that to happen. And until we, we actually game. play another game. Remember we were there at noon. We were there for like a, another, because we were there for the first four, four game day, the Wednesday. The Wednesday. Um, we were there for Thursday, man. We were supposed to see Florida State and Clemson. They were out there shooting layups. And then yeah, we'd already made it. We'd already got at least I had. I think you had too. We'd already come to grips with the weren't going to be any fans in the in the right, right, right. But we were the bands were there. The atmosphere was still there. We were okay with that. And then and then Commissioner Swafford decides to just end the whole thing. So I'm still wait. I'm still in my mind. I'm still waiting for UVA to take the floor. Sometime was it Thursday or it Thursday was Thursday night? It was a Thursday. I'm still waiting for UVA to take the floor Thursday night in the Greensboro Coliseum. Well, we were supposed to play Notre Dame, I think, that night because I think they yes. had won the night before. Yes, that right. Notre Dame. So yeah, gosh, yeah, it, it, that's it, that was March 12th. We uh, we had we we were there watching warmups, um, thinking, okay, they're gonna play, they're gonna play. You had some instinct, and you walked down in a tunnel, and you got to hear a lot of stuff you probably shouldn't have heard. Then we had uh, we had lunch, a late lunch with Jerry Ratcliffe at Possibilities, uh, talking with the owner there, who was, I mean, not only devastated, the, devastated because she missed out on ACC tournament week, and then the next week, uh, Greensboro was supposed to host the uh, first round, first two rounds of the NCAA tournament, and she'd ordered all this food, had all these staffers lined up and everything else. I mean, so we were chatting about that with her for a couple hours, came back home, and then uh, we pretty much been home ever since. <laughs> Oh so, yeah, Maine. Maine. Yeah. And, uh, you got to see this last year, Scott. See, I'm, I'm remembering back. You're getting the, the flood of memories working here. I missed the main. UVA played Maine in Charlottesville last year. Yes. 
I fortunately missed that game because I had tickets to Hamilton uh, in Richmond. And so I went and saw Hamilton for the third time. Um, you unfortunately did not have tickets to Hamilton or a dentist appointment or anything else to give you an excuse not to see that game. Wasn't that the game? The final score was like 46, 26. Yeah, that, that game set, that game had James Naismith rolling over in his grave. <laughs> if I there's mean, anything left you, of James Naismith. I mean, if your car would have broken down, if you would have had a migraine, I mean, you know, if a horse would have kicked you in the teeth or something, you would have, you would have uh, taken any of those instead of having to watch that game. Instead, you had to watch it. So I'm thinking this year is going to look a little different than last year's game between you. Yeah, and, and Chris, yeah, I think, I don't think Maine broke 30. They had 26. It was 46, 20, I, I, 46, 26 in that. So we won a game by 20 points where we had, we scored 46 points. Well, that's, that's only possible if you're UVA basketball. <sighs> Just think about that. You won a game by 20 points, but yet you scored less than 50. <laughs> that happens. The, the only time I can remember that happening frequently was when I was coaching my son's eight and seven, eight, nine youth league teams. When it wouldn't be nothing unusual to win a game 46 to eight. Yeah, yeah. I actually remember too. I went up to New York for a game. UVA beat Rutgers in a similar kind of score. It was like 47 25 or something like that. Um, so, yeah, we've won more than one game that way. Uh, but this, you know, with, with uh, Sam Hauser uh, giving us a, a, a glimmer, yeah. And today's Wednesday. We're a week away, Scott, from next Wednesday. So, um, you know, we'll have to hunker down a bit more. We won't, you know, at least at the start of the season, maybe for the entire season, we probably won't be courtside. Um, uh, but, uh, you That's know. Okay, man. I mean, we're, we're, you know, we, we're moving with the vaccine, the, 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 the promising outlook for that. Then we know that next year things should be completely different. They should be, yeah, and and yeah. So we'll, we'll and in the meantime, they're playing games, and that's all that matters. We're, we have a we have Ab, here's what we're looking forward to, Scott. We're looking forward to UVA Abilene Christian in football on Saturday. We're looking forward to UVA Maine in basketball next Wednesday. I couldn't be happier. <laughs> yeah, life is good. So one last tidbit about the Maine game to show you the how grueling that game was on spectators, players, coaches, and even us in the media. So. In the post-game press conference before Tony walked in, they were drawing straws to see who would have to ask the first question after the, the obligatory UVA uh, radio network question. They were drawing straws to see who had to ask. Because can you imagine having to come up with a reasonably um, um, uh, question of any substance to Tony? When you win a game 46 to 26? I was driving back. We were, my wife and I were driving back from Richmond. She was driving. I was, I was in the passenger seat. And we couldn't even get the game on the radio for some reason. So I was having to it follow. It probably had something to do with FCC not allowing things like that to be. <laughs> yeah. so the the DCC restrictions thereof, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's a good one. The, uh, so I was, try I was having to follow on stat broadcast. Uh, and I was thinking that it was just poor Wi-Fi on the interstate because I kept hitting refresh and the score wasn't updating. Score wasn't moving. <laughs> no, it wasn't. Because <laughs> and then I noticed, well, gosh, it does look like the clock's moving. I mean, you know, it, it, it's two minutes less than it was the last time I refreshed. Now it's four minutes less. Uh, well, you know yeah. how we follow the games, and that's one one advantage that we'll have. Hopefully, we'll have the ability to follow stat broadcast. Uh, oh, well, yeah, watch. we'll have to, yeah, you know, and, and this weekend's football game, Scott, you, you may have noticed this, and I'll say it maybe it's one of our last things we'll say on the show today. Uh, it's on Masson. Um, yeah, Raycom or RSN, regional sports. Well, it, for me, at least, it's on Masson. I mean, I, you, you, you have, I think, satellite. I, for, for Comcast people where I am, it's on Masson 2, maybe, whatever it is, it's on Masson 1 or 2. Um, and, and that's significant for two reasons. One, at least, I don't have to go find it somewhere else. And two – it makes me remember that Masson exists like outside of baseball season. I don't know why it exists outside of baseball season, but it does exist. And I guess the UVA Babylon Christian game, what else are going to do? Show more poker, I guess. So well, um, we're replacing here's, poker. here's a uh, frightening thought. If you're the ACC, 
is if the mass in broadcast is actually of higher quality from the broadcasting standpoint than the ACC quality is. And, and if Masson had forgot, uh, here's how I, bad I think the ACC network is. If, if Masson had Gary Thorne and Rob Carpenter thinking, Masson thinking that it was a baseball game or, or Gary Thorne and Jim Palmer calling that game, they would still be better than the ACC clowns. Uh, we're both fact, fans. That would be a, a ratings bonanza. UVA Abilene Christian and the announcers would be Gary Thorne and Jim Palmer. Uh, or FP and, and let FP and Carper do the second half. Um, right. Honestly, yeah. honestly, Scott, if if they just had silence, silence, it will be better. Uh, the commercials, at least, won't be the repeat of Packer and Durham. Uh, that that house ad that shows you the. Uh, overview of the Wake Forest Stadium and South Beach and all that. I mean, they show those like 100 times a day. Uh, I'm imagining we're not going to have three-minute infomercials for those tack glasses. Um, how many of those glasses and how many spurtles? Is it spurtles? Those, how about those, um, the, the razor you can use, the, this, the uh, underwater the razor underwater. You it's something real handy to be able to shave and go scuba diving. We can shave and wear our sunglasses underwater with Billy Packer and West Durham, apparently. Um, so at least we'll get something different there. And yeah, different announcers. Um, I'm not sure. I've, actually, Scott, I've seen who they're going to be. I'm, I'm not sure they're going to be better. I do think we'd be better with dead air. Um, but uh, hey. Well, that's how I typically watch an ACC game is just turn it down and watch it. And, and, you know, we were talking Monday, my experience of actually being at the stadium outside, yeah, watching the game and, and then following it on my phone because I have the ACC network on my phone. Um, I don't know if it's like this for everyone, but typically the, the, the television feed is about 20 to 30 seconds behind the actual game action, which to me, I can understand maybe a five or six second, second delay, just in case an announcer were to go brain dead and say something he shouldn't, but 30 seconds? I mean, are they using ever-ready batteries to power the trucks? Here's why this is. Uh, I was discussing this general topic in the press box with um, with with Wade Branner, the uh, the voice of VMI Sports. I, I worked the, uh, the their fall football game, this fall football scrimmage this past weekend, and we were discussing around this topic. Um, and, and I mentioned that, yeah, you know, I've watched you know, all six UVA games so far on the ACC Network. And, and none of those six games have the announcers been in the stadium. They've, they've been remote. Yeah. And he said, you know, we can't – he, he was making the point, we can't do that at VMI. They don't have the ability to do that. Um, and so, as a result, we have to, we had to be at the stadium. He and I had to be at the stadium to broadcast the game. But as a result, our you know, we're still on a seven-second delay, not a 30- or 45-second delay. But because uh, your announcers are at home uh, for those ACC games – they ha not only have to have a seven second delay, they have to have that further delay because those people have to see the game uh, in their in their home studio, and then their their audio is then you know is then placed on top of the track, and then and then got, got, it's got to go through all those layers to get to us as viewers. So, I mean, I'm surprised it's only thirty or forty five seconds and not a minute or two minutes um, as a result of that. Yeah, it's it's terrible. I mean, it's just. Don't so those like you know if it, any sports writers who are watching this, I mean, who for some reason maybe you've gotten lopped off the uh, the, the the good list. We, you're like us on the naughty list, and you can't be in the stadium Saturday, um, and it'll be your first time. Uh, and you're used to stat broadcasts. And Scott, I don't know if you've even followed stat broadcasts uh, this this season. It's not good in this one sense. I mean, it's great because I love I love the stats I get from it. But uh, where it's not good is if I've because I know this. I mean, because as you point out, it's it's a it's a delay uh, from the from the gameplay to what you see on the TV, and it's closer to that forty five seconds. So if I forget and I want to look up a stat, hey, I wonder what Brennan Armstrong's uh, passing numbers are, and I click, they've already played two plays, yeah, <laughs> and and all of a sudden I've got to pretend that I don't know that UVA just scored a touchdown, and my wife's sitting there with me, and she's like, oh yeah, it's third down, and I already know, well hell, they they just kicked the extra point. Um, and so then I got, oh, yay, we scored the touchdown because that's how far off it is. 
yeah. from, from and stat broadcast as we know when we're in a stadium is instantaneous. So no, it's, well, it's most fans don't have access to stat broadcast. I don't believe. Do no, they? you don't. No, you have to have a password, and luckily we have the password. But yeah. I make that point more for the sports writers. But it it it, it is that far off, and so yeah. I mean, with me so bringing it up, were, it almost makes me think that I'm like the person that told the little kid that there's no Santa Claus because. I didn't think anything about it until I left that game at halftime and drove home and then got home and started watching it, realizing that what I'm watching happened a half a minute ago or and maybe maybe longer. Probably a minute ago, actually. So then just to kind of do an experiment, I, I turned the volume down, which I have since completely remained <laughs> turned down. Even the radio is behind. Not 30 seconds, but the, the Dave, Dave Kane and Tony and Cub are, are, are about 15 seconds behind what actually is taking place because I'm, I'm gauging it by they're about 15 seconds ahead of the TV guys. Mm -hmm. But I'm knowing that they're still about 15 seconds behind what actually took place. So, boy, there's just some – this pandemic has really created a lot of strange bedfellows, has it? It has, yeah. It's uh, and we've learned a lot as a result. And you know, I think one thing that ESPN has learned, and this is probably something that's going to stick, if those guys can do the games from home uh, now, why would you pay for them to drive down a day early next year, stay in a hotel, have to pay them to drive back? Because they're paying their transportation, they're paying for their hotel. Well, a lot of it, not drive, but fly, or or fly, yeah, as the case may be. All right, all right. Either way, pay their transportation. Uh, pay them and, and probably pay them for that extra day of work, uh, you know, to get ready. Why would you pay all that next year? You've already realized you can save the money and they can do the game. So we're going to get, I mean, it, it, but I will say this as a guy who broadcast a game last weekend in person um, versus brought, I mean, cause you, you'll see this, especially Scott, uh, now that you've seen a game in person this year and, and, and had that experience. Um, I, the TV cameras for any game don't pan out far enough for you to see the defensive secondary. So if the offense is over here, you, it, it's focused on the quarterback in the center, uh, and you see what the offense is doing. You see the guy in motion, but you don't see really the linebackers and beyond. So um, you don't know what a lot. You don't know if they're in cover two or cover three or, or cover four, cover zero, cover one, whatever. You don't know what they're if they're going. You, you can see if they're blitzing, but. There's so much you can't see. And, and I really saw that last week because it was a scrimmage game. But, I'm, I, man, I can, I can read the defense now. I haven't done that all season. And so, um, but that said, I, I think ESPN is going to say cheap. Hey, let's go cheap and let's keep these guys at home. And we've already got the technology in our houses. Let's just do it that way. And we save some money. Um, but it's, it, it does affect your broadcast. It affects how you watch the game and report on the game. I know that. God, I mean, my reporting this year is pretty much just report. I mean, we've been reporting off TV, so it's it's not as rich as it would be if we're in a stadium. And so, but hopefully, the light at the end, we're we're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. Hopefully, um, so the other good the, the the good you know you have to look for the silver lining here, and the silver lining to the ACC network this year is now, if you have the tack light. The entire city of Waynesboro could go dark and you could stand out in your backyard and turn it on and light the entire city of Waynesboro up. Well, and, and if it was like, if the city went dark because of flooding, I could light it up with the tack light and I could still, I could still have a, a, a fresh, close shave. Yeah. You could uh, swim down to main street and shave on the way. That's right. I, you know, there, there's that aspect. Um, and so there's a, I mean, there's a lot of benefit outside of that. I mean, those are the two commercials. So, um, you know, maybe I could have a podcast from Packer and Durham uh, and listen to while I'm swimming. I mean, that would just be, that would just be the trifecta right there. Um, I, I don't like to, 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 you know, piss on people's parades, but I just can't stand, I can't stand those guys. And, and, and I love the ACC and I never thought, I, you know, I got the AC, I mean, I got YouTube TV just for the AC network and I, I only watch it when I have to. And I was so looking forward to watching like talk shows that were ACC specific and that sideline huddle thing they do. That is the worst yeah. television in history. Hmm, it's just not good. I mean, you know, and then I even listen, Scott, and I don't know if you've done this, but like I have Sirius XM in, in both my cars. And when I drive down to Lexington for, for broadcasting, there's an ACC um, channel 
on Sirius XM. And it's so bad. It's done out of New York. And like half the time, the people who they're not, they're physically, they live in New York and they're, they're, they're in half the time. They're talking about like taking the subway to the radio station. And they, 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 they don't know where Greensboro is. They don't know where, you know, how to get to Columbia or, or, or Atlanta or Clemson or anything. They don't know any of this stuff. They're just people who got hired because they, Sent a resume they have no in. clue what Tobacco Road is. They, yeah, they sent a resume into ESPN and they wanted to work for, you know, they wanted to work in Bristol, Connecticut. And they said, no, you're going to be on the AZ network. You got to go to New York and do this show. I mean, it's just awful. Wait, I mean, I was so it's probably the, the crux of why the ACC is so, the network is so bad. You know, getting back to Packer and Durham, we, I mean, we've known those guys forever. If you're old like me, you knew their fathers forever. Um, nothing wrong with those guys, but but having covered the league like we have, we could sit here within a couple of minutes and toss out 10 or 15 names that would be better equipped to do that show than yeah, Packer and Durham. We know people in the ACC that would be far better than those guys. And, you know, and you talk about the serious XM, I get that too. And I, the same thing comes to my mind. These people that are in New York, they don't know anything about the ACC. They have nothing. When, when I talk about Tobacco Road, I know what Tobacco Road is. I can tell you the best barbecue joints along Tobacco Road. They wouldn't know Tobacco Road from, you know, um, Broadway or Fifth Avenue. You know, they really wouldn't. It's frustrating because we were so looking. I, I was looking for it for five years. And when we first heard about the AZ Network all those years ago, Man, I can't wait. I'll watch that 24-7. That's, I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna rip the knob off on that channel. And it's just, it's just not, it's just not. So um, hey, this weekend, UVA football. Uh, okay, that's the thing about it. We got UVA football, we got UVA basketball, and we don't even have to watch the AZ network for a few days. That's that's the best thing. Um, and a vaccine on the way. And a vaccine's on the way. Hey, so all right, Scott, it's a good show. Okay, well, uh, I will, you, if yeah. I'm uh, afforded the opportunity, I'll be available Saturday. We can talk football afterwards. Yeah, let's do that. Let's let, let's let's go ahead and and and, and uh, schedule that one now. So for our viewers out there, listeners on the podcast, uh, that game kicks off at three thirty or four. Four so o'clock. Seven, seven, four o'clock. So seven fifteen, seven thirty ish. We'll yeah. we'll give you the breakdown of UVA's blowout win over Abilene Christian. Hopefully that we're not talking about any injuries. We're just talking about a big win and moving on. So. Yeah, but we'll do that. We'll do that Saturday evening, and um, that'll be great. Well, Scott, thank you for your time as always today. Thank you, Chris. And for our viewers, listeners, thank you as well. We will talk to you again on Saturday.